Welcome to the Renal Research Institute's Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology, where we share knowledge and advances in kidney research with the world. In this episode, we talk with Dr. Bernard Canot, Senior Chief Scientist for Fresenius Medical Care, about creatinine, an old molecule with new insights. We delve deep into a clinically and predictive value of simplified creatine index used as a muscle maze surrogate in end-stage kidney disease. We also give an overview of the hemodialysis patient results from the International Monitoring Dialysis Outcomes Initiative. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Professor Bernard Canot to today's episode of Frontiers in Kidney Disease and Biology. Dr. Cano is Emeritus Professor of Nephrology at the Montpellier University School of Medicine in France. He graduated with a Doctor of Medicine from Montpellier Medical School and received his Master of Science Doctorate in Nutrition from the University of Montpellier. Dr. Cano has contributed to the development of the European Best Practice Guidelines and Fluid uh, Purity on vascular access and also on anemia management. And he has been co-investigator of the international DOPS study. He's senior chief scientist at Fresenius Medical Care, the global medical office, and is former chief medical officer of FMC, Europe, Middle East, uh, and Africa region. Today, uh, Dr. Cano and I will talk a bit about a, a recent paper of his about creatinine a molecule we thought we knew everything about, but there is apparently some news. So, uh, Dr. Cano, Bernard, welcome to this episode of um, Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So, it will be a pleasure to exchange with you on this creatinine, which is a new story with all products. Yeah, so uh, Bernard, can you tell us a bit about creatinine? actually, it's just to, to set everyone, what is its function? Is it a uremic toxin? I mean, we know that creatinine levels rise as the kidney fail, but is this just a byproduct or does it have indeed some toxic effects? Well, that's a good question because at the end we classify the creatinine in the uremic toxin, but in fact there is no evidence that is really a toxic substance. And I would say maybe on the opposite, since we know the creatinine accumulation is reflecting the kidney failure or the decline of the GFR, and it has been used for eGFR, I would say different formula to establish what is the kidney function, the equivalent kidney function with the accumulation or increase of the creatinine. This is one side of the coin. Now, if you look on the other side of the coin, you understand that the creatinine is coming from the muscle. And the muscle, it's, I would say, a constant product, production over the, the day, meaning at the end that reflecting the kidney function and the muscle generation on the other side. If you make a, I would say, a ratio between generation rate and elimination rate, and then you find the creatinine concentration in the blood. So you understand that it is two, two sides of the same coin. Nephrologists are re regarding creatinine as a GFR equivalent, but as a nephrologist interested by nutrition, I was looking on the creatinine for the muscle mass and nutritional aspect. So certainly that would be very interesting to discuss because study is what's reflecting such, I would say, creatinine generation rate, which we call simplify creatinine index, but simplify creatinine index, it's just a way to scale creatinine production by kilo and per day, no more. So actually, when I think about it, it's really interesting. Nephrologists think about the elimination part of creatinine, right? The yeah. elimination by glomerular filtration rate or GFR. And you, in your thinking, are focusing on the production aspect of creatinine, on the generation aspect of creatinine. Is this a, a fair statement? I think it's a fair statement because if you just remember a little bit about creatinine filtration and I would say kinetics in the kidney, we know that creatinine in it filters almost freely from the GFR, 
But they are still on the tubular, distal part of the tubular, some secretion, which could be affected by some medication. And in the past, if we remember, we were using tagamet, with the substances to block this secretion, mm -hmm. to make sure that at the end, using the creatinine, that was a way to make an assessment of the GFR. Now, this is one aspect. I am a little bit on the other side. I agree, creatinine is a fantastic I would say, marker for kidney function. But if you look inside the urine, now you calculate the amount of creatinine that you are eliminating per day, and then you find a completely different story. Just an example, and that's part of the forms study in the 70s, who make a fantastic job, and I was really impressed by this creatinine, I would say, finding. It makes a perfect relationship. Amount of creatinine per day in terms of gram of milligrams. I'm a little bit more familiar in micromol in Europe we are using, but no way. It's easy because molecular weight of the creatinine is 113 Dalton, so it's a factor of 10. Just remember that one gram of creatinine per day in urine is equivalent to about 30 kilos of lean tissue mass. And then there is a linear relationship. If you move to two grams, then you get 60 kilos. And based on this element, you can make a fantastic assessment of the muscle mass. Not only the muscle mass, or you can make a measurement from bioimpedance or different physical, I would say, way of assessing, but by the creatinine, it reflects the muscle activity because we know that the creatinine in the muscle is reflecting the contraction of the muscle. So at the end, you get, I would say, a little bit more information about muscle activity. And this is my interest for the creatinine today. Yeah. So, uh, but um, you need to collect urine in order to understand how much creatine is actually produced, say, per day, and so that you can do your calculation and say, okay, one gram creatinine appearance per day uh, correlates with 30 kilogram of muscle. However, in, in real life, do you need to collect the urine or can the level as such tell you something about muscle mass? And because I think there is uh, some additional steps necessary, isn't this right? Correct. Great. Now, of course, uh, there is a trade-off. If you want to make a, an assessment for a, a chronic kidney patient, or I would say regular LT volunteers, and if you want to make an assessment from the muscle mass, you need to collect urine because this is easy, the easiest way. Now, I understand the question is coming in uh, patient on diesis, which is a different story, of course, because it's a little bit more complex. You are not on the steady state. You get, I would say, fluctuation from the peak and valet. But now taking advantage of this peak and valet, you can have a sort of creatinine kinetic modeling, knowing that distribution volume of creatinine is close to urea, close to the water. So making, if you know pre and post and pre, then you can make a lot of calculation like your kinetic modeling. You can make an assessment of creatinine mass removed during the decision and then, and then equivalent to the appearance rate over the cycle because there is a law of conservation of mass. So meaning that if you know what you are removing on one side, you can expect that it's equivalent to what the patient would produce. So on one side, either you collect the urine to make an assessment on I would say ambulatory patient with a kidney function, or you move on more complex kinetic creatinine kinetic modeling, or you go to a different formula, and that was was applied to this study using a simplified creatinine index, which was taking advantage of previous study, making linear relationship or more complex relationship with KTOV and then creatinine concentration plus anthropometric parameters of the patient. So different way to make an assessment, but not so complex because at the end, the idea is to get a simplified bedside formula to make such assessment. Yeah. So in other words, in order to understand the generation rate of creatinine in the muscle, something that correlates with muscle mass, you need to understand somehow the elimination of creatinine, right? And in patients with intact kidney function, in patients who still produce urine, 
in one steady state. You just need to collect the urine. And it doesn't really matter if the GFR is 120 ml per minute or 60 ml per minute, as long as they're in steady state. The problem is when patients produce no longer any urine. And, and then you have to resort to some more sophisticated modeling. But you have done all of this and eventually you arrived at what you call the, the simplified creatinine index. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about how, what was your thought process? How did you actually arrive at this, I think, really valuable uh, index of muscle mass? Yeah, the idea was, of course, to use what we do on a monthly basis on the dialysis. So you have lab assessment on the patient on dialysis, but I know a lot of centers does not make an assessment of creatinine pre and post. If you get the pre and post creatinine concentration, you can do very simple calculation. Now, if you have the urea and the cathedral from urea, any form of single pool or double pool, you can make adjustment. No way the creatinine pre, then you can anticipate what would be the creatinine post. And based on this element, you can calculate quite easily the, the clearance of the creatinine equivalent and then the mass of creatinine removed precision. So that's uh, the starting point. Using cathedral and then estimating what will be removed during the decision. It does not matter, I would say, from IMO or IMO definition, the technique, it doesn't matter. And then using some anthropometrics, such as the body weight, such as age, gender, and creatinine pre, then V you can calculate easily. We de develop different formula, putting a lot of parameters inside, but at the end, we went to the, simple, the, the easiest way to make such assessment, and it works. So at the end, the idea was to use very simplified formula, very uh, cost efficient, because you don't need to make more, uh, I would say, lab tests, just using the pre plus something which is used. And uh, that's a way of make, making this uh, creatinine, simplified creatinine index. Yeah, and so, uh, and you have described this in great detail in a recent publication where you also validated the formula, right? So, because it's one thing to develop a formula, but then, of course, you have to validate it somehow. But what, what, what did the validation look like? Well, the validation looks uh, fine. The, the only point I didn't mention, of course, in the formula, if the patient keep sort residual kidney function. You need to incorporate this value to make a corrective element on this creatinine generation. And the second point I did not mention, it's preferable not to have, I would say, large diets with protein intake just before the diet, because of course, what you are ingesting with the meat, for example, could affect this creatinine generation. Now, in the literature and particularly from Forbes, there is a factor showing that diet is affecting than about one or two percent this creatinine generation over the, the element. So at the end, it's easy. But if you get an anuric patient, it's a first, easier. If you consider this dietary protein intake, it's another factor to create. And then the validation was performed in different, I would say, cohort initially in Montpellier, and then we put second cohort was in the DOPS with a large data set, and the third one with a Mondo, which is also a huge data set, showing that at the end it works in the same way. And then again, it's not uh, just a precise value for the simplified creatine index. I'm not looking for a cross-sectional value. I'm looking for a trend, because the tremendous value of these parameters yeah. is a time change of a yeah the value of the time, because at the end, it gives you some information about weight gain or weight loss and uh, affecting the lean tissue mass. So uh, it's uh, in a kinetics way that we have to follow this indicator, not on cross-section. I think this makes a lot of sense. What you envision, or I guess what's done already in some places, is to calculate the, the, um, the simplified creatinine index over time, and then look into the trajectory of the simplified creatinine index. 
Um, do you have experience how how the simplified creatine index actually changes as um, as people, for example, uh, get sick or as people uh, are you know approaching the end of their life? Now that's excellent because if you look inside the Mondo manuscript and the study before moving to illness. The idea was to look on gender effects, so male versus female, and age, and it correlates perfectly with this physiologic change. Male get 20 milligrams per kilo per day, female gets 15, 16 milligrams per kilo per day. This is in the age of 40, 50 years old. Now, if you go on the elderly, 60, 70, do you see that you are losing 1% per year? meaning that it correlates perfectly with the lean tissue mass that we are wasting. This is a normal with the aging population. Now, if you put this uh, in sickness and then you identify some patient affected by any disease, I don't want to go into detail because we were not looking on the cause of this uh, illness, but cancer, infection, cardiac disease, then you see the decline of the simplified creatinine index, which is not 1%, but could be 2 to 3%, meaning that, as to answer your question, six to seven months before the patient dies, you identify that there is a sort of break in this kinetic trajectory of the simplified creatinine index, and then there is a step decline going to the death. And you know that, for example, if the patient is moving from 20 to 15 and then 10 milligrams per kilo per day, you know that the outcome would not very good, would not be very good within a few weeks. So, uh, so if I understand this correctly, what you are saying is that the simplified creatine index that you, Pernah, um, uh, have developed could also be applied to uh, to patients with other chronic disorders, or do you see also a use case, say, in the general population, like, for example, in people who, in, in athletes, to follow their development of muscle mass, or in, you know, in, in, in this kind of scenarios, or would you really, in this case, go to, uh, to other means to assess muscle mass? I think it's a, it's a good question. The idea is of depending on the complexity, but if you just want to collect urine, this is easy way to make such a calculation. So, by the way, you can apply to non-renal patient or any type of patient, body builder, for example. If you, I was interested in the past by uh, not patient, but some patient where bodybuilding, taking, I would say, supplement of protein, and then you see a tremendous increase of this creatinine index, so meaning that is reflecting something in a very specific population. Now, if the kidney disease is progressing, then you can follow the same step because NPCR reflecting diet protein intake is also affected in this simplified creatinine index. If you see over the time the progression of the kidney disease, then you, you have a decline of calorie protein intake, dietary protein intake, but on the, on the parallel, you see a decline of the creatinine index, meaning reflecting muscle mass or muscle wasting. Yes. So, so it, you, it applies. I'm wondering, do you think it would be useful to have your simplified creatinine index or a variation of it, uh, say, put on an app so that uh, so that uh, physicians actually could follow it or, or something like this? Uh, do you see, or, or maybe it's done already? No, that's uh, perfect. Yeah, in the past I mentioned, because this is, uh, I would say, I want to thank Forbes for the tremendous works, because this is exactly the master of the creatinine muscle mass body composition change. So it was really putting that in perspective. But why not an app? Because at the end, it's so easy. But again, you need to collect something. I would say creatinine from the plasma would not be sufficient. You need to collect urine. So why not following creatinine, sodium, urea from the urine? So you get tremendous information about the nutritional status of the patient, from the muscle activity to diet protein intake, and also sodium. But that would be a nice app to develop to make some risk assessment for such patients. But it will make sense. Now, yeah. if we want to compare to 
different instructor tools like bioimpedance or I would say muscle strength because that's also a topic that was interested. There is a fantastic relationship between this creatinine index and the muscle strength. So meaning if you make a, a grasp testing, then you have a nice correlation with this physical activity and the muscle strength. And also we found, and you know, from the uh, Mondo initiative, we found some relationship perfectly a relation, uh, with a linear relationship with the bioimpedance, with lithium mass, with some, I would say, a little bit discrepancy, but again, I'm not sure by the bioimpedance we are measuring the same muscle mass as I am talking about the creatinine index, because bioimpedance is measuring something, calculating, but I'm not sure that is measuring the active part of the muscle, because creatinine is coming from creatine, meaning the fossil creatine, which is the energy, I would say, element of the muscle contraction. So uh, this is why I'm completely uh, on your side to say creatinine index is a fantastic market, but it, do, it can be correlated with different elements, but muscle strength and bioimpedance could be the two tools to be tested. So this is actually really interesting. So you are saying it that the creatine index captures the the active muscle part and not just the quote unquote less active or, or inactive muscle part because biologically speaking, I would think that it's the active muscle part that's more relevant. Is is this correct? Correct. Correct, this is exactly the point. And this is why maybe the inflammation, for any reason, maybe affect, could affect this creatinine index. I didn't mention, but in the past, in my clinical life, I would say, creatinine index was performed in all the patients with a creatinine kinetic modeling, not just based on the simplify, and also confirmed by direct quantification from the diazid. So I was collecting the diazid and to make the formula that was based on this direct quantification. So the creatinine index in some tennis players that I have in diesis was 40, and the rugby guy was 50 milligrams per kilo per day. So that means almost two to three times the value I mentioned. So I'm completely confident that we are me measuring some muscle active part and not just the an anatomic part of the muscle. So that's really interesting that you that you think you can differentiate between functional or, or a highly active part of muscle and, and the less active part of muscle. I remember years ago, a patient of mine, she presented with very high creatine values, but had a totally normal kidney function. And it turned out she was an she was an athlete with the military and she yeah. took quite substantial amount of creatine uh, supplements. Yeah. Uh, how would um, creatine supplements affect the, um, the muscle mass assessment by the creatine index? Well, that could be a question. I did not explore this element. The point is, of course, as soon as you introduce creatine as a supplement. Of course, the creatinine will increase. But again, I don't know, we need to follow over the time because the increase, acute increase of the creatinine could reflect the creatine transformation in creatinine. Now, over the time, it would be nice to see if the muscle mass is increasing and then maybe to use bioimpedance to make such a correlation because creatinine index would change over the time but the acute change should be creatinine supplementation, but long-term or chronic change, that could reflect the muscle mass change. So, but again, this is a little bit tricky because we did not get this type of information, but that would be interesting to follow. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, uh, muscle mass can be determined by various means. You mentioned bioimpedance. Um, already, but I guess DEXA might be another option sure. or other imaging techniques like MRI and and others. Uh, but uh, obviously, the the creatinine index it's it's non-invasive. It's it doesn't require specialized uh, hardware such as an MRI machine or DEXA. So so do you? I mean, 
do you think that uh, that the creatinine index as a measure of muscle mass will be actually used more widely in the future? This is my hope, because when you develop something and you think it's good, but this is a biased view that I have. Of course, it's so easy. And I'm, I would say, plaguing for the, the large use of the creatinine index, because it does not cost any extra, I would say, money. Easy to implement. It's just based on the calculation, and certainly it would be useful to detect some abnormality in the muscle mass, and maybe I did not mention, but certainly you think about how to intervene in the patient when you see a decline of the creatinine index, because you can identify quite early some abnormality, I don't know. And then you can maybe motivate or stimulate the patient to get a little bit more trained exercise, and maybe during the diuresis or outside the diuresis, because this would be a way of improving the body composition, but certainly we need to implement in a sort of regular checklist in the diet patient or not on the diet patient, but certainly it would be easy. I think, uh, Bernard, as you mentioned, um, I mean, nowadays the estimated glomerular filtration rate each EFR is reported with each lab report, right, whenever creatine is measured. So, so I could see a situation that uh, muscle mass is reported uh, whenever a urine collection takes place and all the the necessary measurements are are present. So I think this this is something actually that I think uh, could be pursued in the future. Sure, you're right. And uh, what one point uh, just to make sure that we think about and talk about the same creatinine. There is different way to make a dosing of creatinine. And uh, you know that the Jaffe method was the old one, the colorimetric, which is not used or maybe used, but then you need to correct to get this creatinine by immunoassay. That's the only one, because if you are still using the creatinine from Jaffe, there is an overestimation, which is uh, close to 10 to 15%. So you have to be careful when we use the creatinine to make sure that, again, we are calculating in the same way, because again, yeah. this is the same for the EGFR. There is a way to correct creatinine value yeah. based on this, I would say, dosing differences. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned this because um, it's important to to make sure that the, the, the formula you developed does, would not work for the Yaffe method. Uh, it has to be uh, yeah. the, the new method, right? Yeah. Correct, okay. correct. Now, you already indicated somehow a relationship between inflammation and muscle mass. And, and sarcopenia is, of course, a major, major problem in kidney patients. So how, how does actually inflammation interact with muscle mass? And is there also possibly a role, say, for uremic toxins to, um, to uh, cause downstream eventually sarcopenia, so this lack of, of muscle mass? Well, that's also a very interesting question, because if you want to make a link, I would say uremic toxin, you have a lot of uremic toxin who can affect the muscle metabolism. But my perception is now following Tit's works about the sodium. And I'm thinking that the sodium is a cause of this inflammation, and as these groups have perfectly shown, this accumulation of sodium within the muscle, the skin we know, but within the muscle, is completely recycling energy consumption inside the muscle. And if you remember, some of the study of uh, Tits group shown that sodium accumulation within the muscle is a cause of protein energy wasting. So my understanding or my feeling is maybe the inflammation that we see in our patient could be linked to the sodium and not only the sodium osmotic one, but tissue sodium and particularly the sodium which is accumulated within the skin and a muscle. And this is a way to reprioritize osmolate production in the muscle. So I'm really on this side of the thinking now. 
for our audience. So the the thought process here is that was really pioneered by Jens Tietze uh, in, in work that goes now back, I would say, 10 years or so, is that there is uh, non-osmotic storage of salt, of sodium, in skin and muscle. And that this storage is both enhanced by inflammation, but also triggers inflammation, right? Correct. And, right. and, and uh, but what I'm not entirely sure is, and maybe you can enlarge on this a bit, how does sodium storage in the tissue relate to sarcopenia? Is it, is it the cause or the consequence of, okay. uh, of sarcopenia? And maybe That's it's both. Good. Yeah, yeah, I think it's both because it's difficult. We don't have any study, I would say comparative study, showing that uh, if you reduce sodium con content in the tissue, you improve this uh, muscle mass, unfortunately. What we know, is there are some association, but more you get sodium accumulation in the muscle and the skin. And there is numbers based on sodium MRI. If you move to 30 or 40 millimoles per liter, then you get, I would say, tremendous catabolism of the muscle, and that creates the sarcopenia. So what would be the reverse? If you reduce or so, remove this sodium from the muscle and the skin, does the muscle is recovering? I don't know, because nobody gets this type of information. But following Tit's works, it's impressive to see what is linked with the sodium accumulation in the tissue. This is the best way to modify completely the metabolism from the muscle, from the receptor and from the insulin, because now there is a link with insulin resistance. So at the end, if you think about the muscle, it's at the interface. So what will be now the impact of the sodium accumulation within the muscle in terms of phosphocreatinine, uh, in terms of, I would say, transfer or the ADP, ATP, I don't know. And nobody knows, but I see some link with this muscle. So I would be interested to see now, if we are able to remove this sodium, to deplete sodium from the muscle and the skin, what happened to the muscle? Could be a, a next question for, I would say, clinical investigation. Yeah, so uh, how, how would you want to see, for example, nutritionists use the creatinine index um, in, in their daily practice? So say you have a patient who, is, uh, who has sarcopenia, uh, what kind of nutritional interventions would that be possible? Or is it, or would the interventions go way beyond nutrition? Yeah, but the intervention could have a different perspective. One is, of course, if you think about the patient on diesis, you have to be sure that the diesis delivery is correct, not be uremic. Because in this field, you have so many factors who can affect the muscle. Acidosis, for example, vitamin depletion, uh, anemia, uh, accumulation of, I would say, middle molecule toxin, I don't know which one, so many factors. But my part would be first to make sure that diesis adequacy is correct, then electrolyte acidosis I mentioned is correct, vitamin is correct, micronutrients are correct, and then the next step is a muscle activity or to promote physical activity to make sure that the patient can be retrained because we know that most of the diseases patients get, I would say, sort of deconditioning. So we need to recondition the patient to make some exercise. So depending on the age, depending on the comorbid condition, the reconditioning could be a different, could be in a different way. But that physical activity during the diseases or outside the diseases, just walking, just making some, I would say, aerobic or anaerobic exercise would be sufficient. So we need to combine all these elements. So I find it very interesting that you mentioned in the nutritional assessment also vitamins and micronutrients. In your clinical, clinically speaking, what measurements would you recommend? I mean, should we measure a certain panel of vitamins and micronutrients in, in our patients, or, or what would be in the, in the ideal circumstance? I know there is, of course, economic constraints, and uh, but, but what would you recommend to actually measure? 
I'm not sure that as a pragmatic nephrologist, I would say, knowing that we are losing some of these uh, vitamins, uh, uh, water soluble or uh, I would say micronutrient, why not just supplementing? Because at the end, it's so easy. It's so cheap because if we think about the cost of the treatment and the supplement of this vitamin, I don't want to look maybe folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin C are easy or vitamin D or 25 hydroxy, but the other ones, there is no way to make assessment of, I would say, zinc and all this stuff. But supplementing once a week, I think it would be fantastic because you can get a multi vitaminic system plus micronutrients. It's not so easy. And I'm sure a lot of people take as a supplement this uh, I would say a multivitamin system. So my recommendation is to say, okay, knowing that they are losing, why not supplementing on a regular basis? That would be easier and certainly cheaper. The supplement per, per the multivitamin would be a little bit more cheaper than just making a dosing of very complex elements. This is my recommendation yeah. mm -hmm. from a pragmatic yeah, approach. Yeah. What are your thoughts about uh, nutritional supplements, protein supplements, for example. I mean, here at least in the US, you can buy these protein shakes uh, yeah. at, at almost each street corner. It, do you think that this is of value or is it only of value in certain patients, like those who are not really inflamed or, or what's your, what's your uh, thoughts around that? I think we need to be very careful about uh, diet protein intake because we know that the diet is patient the protein intake is limited. Also, the I would say social aspect and economical aspect of the patient can affect this element and they can switch from, I would say, diet protein intake to some, I would say, low cost energy, which is just based on the glucose or on some element which are not good in this case. So at the end, keeping, I would say, balance between calorie intake and protein intake, but I would say the good value of the protein intake is a meat or equivalent yeah. of meat. Now, if they cannot afford, maybe the supplementation based on, uh, in France, we are lucky, we have the milk, we have the cheese, we have the eggs. So if you look on these three elements, you, you can get very cheap way of supplementing the patient with rich I would say essential or non-essential amino acid easily. So my recommendation before moving to artificial supplement, why not using eggs, cheese, milk, or dairy, dairy, I would say, and then you can get all this, uh, I would say, good protein before moving to the artificial one. Now, if there is no option, then supplementing the patient makes sense with some, I would say, liquid or equivalent of this pills. But for the taste, I think it's much better to get cheese or eggs or mm -hmm. equivalent. Mm -hmm. And the patient will be happy with uh, yeah. such, I would say, kind of product. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I, I know we have only a, um, a minute or two left. Uh, thank you really for this wonderful, interesting uh, conversation and congratulations for you moving forward with with this uh, creatine index as a means to assess uh, skeletal muscle mass. Now, uh, what would you want the audience to take with them, with it? Uh, maybe in, in, a, in a few sentences, how would you summarize uh, your findings on this very specific topic um, not the, towards for, the end of this conversation. Uh, for my side, I think it's a just a way to get to be aware about the creatinine value. Just not considering that the creatinine is a waste product. Creatinine is a fantastic product reflecting mass and mass. So we should make use of this creatinine index as developed to make sure at the end the nephrologists know a little bit more about the creatinine scale, muscle mass train and certainly to implement such simplified creatinine index in this panel of markers. Easy, very cheap, and very useful because that creates a value and I'm sure that a lot of nephrologists will be happy with this element. There are some studies coming, coming from Asia and particularly Japan showing exactly what we found using the same formula. So it works everywhere on the planet. So why not using, this is my clear recommendation to put best practice in, re in reality, in real life. 
Yeah, no, no, really, thank you, uh, Bernard. It's, it's a, a terrific achievement uh, to add some new diagnostic uh, tool uh, to the to the armamentarium we have in our hands uh, when we care for patients. So, really, thank you so much for uh, for the discussion, for the insights you've provided. It was a real delight having you on this um, episode of our uh, kidney medicine and biology series. Thank you and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for the audience. And thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining the Renal Research Institute for this episode of Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology. We invite you to engage with us on our social media channels and look forward to seeing you again soon for the next episode of Frontiers in Kidney Medicine and Biology.